Good evening, everybody. How are you all? I'm a little uh, embarrassed just listening to, uh, to everything that was just uh, said then. Some of those things are true. I think, uh, I think there was a little bit of embellishment there to um, talk me up. But um, here I stand as Steve Willis amongst you all and um, amongst the community. And it's so wonderful to be, to be down here in Albury, you know, sharing with you all. And for those that I've uh, conversed with so far this evening, making me feel welcome, it's, um, it's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm here for a number of reasons. And one of those was made very evident, and that's um, I spent the better part of 10 years in the Australian military um, in a unit called Two Commando. For anyone that, uh, that knows of that unit, it's, um, it's definitely done its... Uh, it's spent a lot of time in the, uh, in the Middle East over the past, gosh, few years, and um, unfortunately I've lost a lot of mates in war, but I've also lost a lot of mates post-war who've to some degree been able to, uh, unable to um, kind of deal with uh, the issues at hand and they took their lives. I've also got a lot of other mates who are still here to this day but really struggle in a daily sense and um, I feel with where I am in life and the fortunate circumstances that have come my way, utilising profile to help be an advocate, be an ambassador, to, um, to talk for those who are unable to um, speak for themselves or, or in some way, shape or form, have the courage or the bravery to be able to do it, to, um, to fight that good fight. I, uh, I also, I guess in leaving the military, was fortunate enough to, uh, to land a role on a, an Australian reality TV show called The Biggest Loser, for those that have watched it over the years. And that's where I was given the name The Commando. Or I went on to call myself Commando Steve, to add that, that Steve name to The Commando to, to humanise me in some way, shape or form outside of the uh, outside of the television or off the television screen in a daily setting where they're training individual clients, um, small group training, you know, even to groups of this size and in the corporate setting. But um, a little bit more about my story and rewinding back to, uh, to my youth. I grew up in, I guess, quite a hostile um, house. Some of you might be able to, uh, to relate to that. I had a father or a stepfather who was um, a victim of his own suffering and the way in which he dealt with most things was with a lot of anger, with a lot of aggression. And I found from an early age that um, I went within myself and I spent a lot of time in my youth, seeking acceptance. I look back now, that acceptance in the way or forms of love and nurture, and it really wasn't there. And then I moved in to those teen years, and teen years are as difficult or difficult enough as it is. And you know, bullying was, um, was a part of my life in my teens. And I struggled. I found it quite difficult each day to, uh, to kind of get up and, and get the job done, whatever that may have been, going to school or the like. And I'm not sure how it quite happened, but exercise became a near and dear friend of mine. But the way in which I engaged with exercise was from a very negative place. A lot of self-loathing. Um, through the exercise, trying to push myself to a place where I would gain recognition from the outside to kind of fill a hole or a void that I felt was within, was within me. And 
much like people use things external to themselves, drugs, alcohol, you know, for adults, even work, you name it, I used exercise as a means to escape, as a means to crush the life out of myself. And I used to do some crazy things. I'd get up early in the morning as a teenager and just run. I remember my, my dad worked out on my push bike that I used to ride to and from school, the paper runs I did before school and after school because he, had, he was of the belief that um, if you wanted something, you had to earn it. And I used to ride on a BMX about 400 kilometers a week. So that I really set a foundation and a uh, and a belief and behaviours in that space around exercise. I identified and attached to it very strongly. It was my safe place. So as I went through my school years and the things that I uh, that I dealt with, I always fell back on exercise. I hit 18, I'd left school, finished year 12, and I, um, I wanted to do a trade as a builder. So I joined the army. And some of the guys, the directive staff at, uh, at recruit training were saying, there's no point being in the army unless you go to infantry. So before you know it, I'd forgotten about the trade. I found myself at the School of Infantry, and I did my initial employment training. And from there, I was posted into what is to this day known as Two Commando and went through the selection process when that uh, had a role change and did my time there. And it was an amazing, a, uh, an amazing experience. I, I met lots of wonderful, fantastic people who really helped to shape me to be the person that I am to this day. And I'm eternally grateful for that. And he told me to pull my neck in when I needed to uh, as a youngster and, uh, and give me some uh, words of advice. I don't know if it was always wisdom. But um, that really reinforced that foundation and those things that I attached so strongly to in those younger years, that exercise, that that competition, that drive, that, that, that physical being. And after about 10 years, I, I felt that there was just so much more to life. It was time to move on. And I, um, I thought about it and there was, there was nothing too uh, clinical in the thoughts. It was more just broad and general. I thought, in leaving the army and my transition back into a civilian life, I'm going to become a trainer. So I did all the courses. I did my Cert 3, Cert 4, and started working in a gym. And within a year, I found myself on national television. I had no formal media training, understanding of what television was about. So I went from this army guy who did a job you know, with his mates, you know, achieve the missions that we uh, and the objectives that were set and you go and have a beer. And now I'm on national television and a reality, te uh, reality show where everything that you do is narrated. So you have to have the gift of the gab, the ability to string two words together. And I didn't have that in any way, shape or form. And in doing The Biggest Loser, what I was presented with were people who felt so compelled to put themselves on national television because their lives had utterly fallen apart and they themselves could not grasp at anything tangible to help turn it around. And they felt it took a television show to do that. And I was, I was very aware of that. It really moved me. And as much as there's the whole process of producing a show and 
you know, getting people to watch it. First and foremost, the people that presented in front of me each and every day that I showed up to work to train them to get them through a competition on a reality TV show were exactly that, people. People who needed help, people who had feelings, people who have emotions and want to have the best life possible or the best that they can possibly have. And they just needed guidance. They needed direction. And all this wonderful stuff and this heartache and this upset that I'd been through in my life, in my younger years, you know, through the military, but setting a framework, you know, sound behaviors and values and attributes and beliefs. I was able to impart some of that knowledge and that understanding. Now, for those that watched it, a lot of the time, you never saw that. You just saw this guy with his arms crossed, you know, sunnies on, pointing his finger. But a lot of that was conveyed as well to the contestants or the people on the show in, um, in this is what's expected. This is what's going to happen, people. You know, and, and we, we, would, we would have deep and meaningfuls and gain an understanding because what I learned from my younger years and through that time in the military is pointing the finger and fear or utilization of fear will have people conform but it doesn't help them change the way in which they think. And to find that common ground, the thing that unites us, so that we all can work from that point and help them to challenge those beliefs, to challenge those behaviours, to accept what is in the present moment and stop rolling over the past and potentially projections into the future and just be in the here and the now and do the best you can possibly do with consistency, with tenacity and, importantly, patience, you will change. And in seeing that, in, in, in understanding that, the comprehension, but also back to those younger years, embodying it, not just having that understanding and going, oh yeah, I get it. You take it and you immerse yourself in it. You marinate yourself in it and you become it. It's not just hot air then, it's not just words. You are a living example of that change. And there's a great Zen Buddhist master I'd love to meet, but I'm not sure if I'll ever get around to it because he's in his 90s, Thich Nhat Hanh. And he talks very much about how a lot of us demand things, expectations of one another. But demanding something can be very challenging because a lot of the time people don't want to conform, whether that's an individual or to change. You've got to be it. And I've heard a lot tonight around kindness, empathy, compassion, being gentle, love, you know, all of those wonderful, beautiful emotions perspectives, ways of being that actually have a basis, something that we can work from. And back to my youth and the upbringing and anger and aggression and guilt and upset, a lot of those very strong, powerful, overwhelming emotions actually have no basis. Nothing good can grow from them. But addressing your own beliefs, your own perspectives around things, and for myself, recognizing that I don't need to be my father, my stepfather, and emulate his actions and ways of being, and putting some space around it, and observing it and being aware of it, I can change. And I'm fortunate, like many of you here, that are parents to have four beautiful children. And in this 
short life that I've had up until this point in time, they have probably been my greatest teacher. Now, we only had 15 minutes to talk and I could probably go on all night. It's a little nerve-wracking at the start, but once you get up and get into a bit of a roll, it's, um, it's quite enjoyable. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up there. And I'd just like to say, once again, thank you to each and every one of you that's, that's come out tonight. You're a game changer. Pain, suffering and fear is real. And we all know it, but it's not unique. And at times, when you're on your own, you may not be in a setting like this, and have what you feel as community behind you, that pain, suffering and fear magnifies. I know. I'm as human as anyone else here. But what coexists alongside of that is all of those other beautiful things. Peace, joy and happiness. You just need to get that lens, recalibrate it or refocus it, and nurture that way of being. It's extremely difficult. It's, it's very easy to just say it. But with practice and with community, we can change. Thank you very much.